Good morning, everyone. We're about to get started. My name is Audra Wilson, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Robin Kelly, who is also the Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust. So welcome this morning. So I have the pleasure of moderating the first panel of the morning, and we'll be talking about disproportionate rates of transmission of chronic hepatitis C and HIV AIDS in communities of color. So a very, very important topic, and we have three wonderful uh, women here to talk to us about this. So I'm going to actually introduce them. They're going to have a great presentation for you, so we want to get started because we're running a little bit behind. After they've finished presenting, um, we will open up the floor to uh, questions, and you'll see the microphones in three different places here. Um, I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about and to uh, ask our panelists. So I'm going to introduce them in order of them speaking. So first to my left is Marsha Martin. And Marsha is the Director of Policy and Partnerships for the Urban Coalition of HIV AIDS Prevention Services in Washington, D.C. And she's a former senior deputy director of the Department of Health, HIV and AIDS Administration, and the former executive director of AIDS Action, a Washington, D.C.-based advocacy group that promotes national policy to strengthen HIV AIDS prevention, care, treatment, and social services. To her left is Dr. Amanda Castell. Dr. Castell is an associate professor, professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at George Washington University, University Milken Institute School of Public Health and co-director of the Master's in Science Public Health Microbiology and Emerging Infectious Diseases Program. She is a medical epidemiologist with board certifications in pediatrics and preventive medicine and completed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Epide Epidemic Intelligence Service Program. And finally, to her left is Ms. Nina De Lorenzo. Nina is the Vice President of Government Affairs Strategy and Public Policy for AbV, with more than 20 years of private sector, political, and government experience. In her current role, she leads a team that, developed AbV, that develops AbV's public stances on critical public policy issues and creates strategies that shape a more favorable public policy environment for AbV's business interests globally. So we're going to actually start with Ms. Marsha Martin, who is going to be doing a bit of a PowerPoint presentation for us. Thank you, Audra. Good morning, everyone. And let me also just thank uh, Dr. Puckren and Congresswoman Kelly for this opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about HIV and a little bit about uh, hepatitis C. And um, we hope that uh, when you leave here today, you have a clear sense of what our challenges are and what some of our community opportunities are. Um, I've entitled my presentation this morning, Minorities, Disparities, and HIV, The March Toward or the Long Haul. And uh, I hope by the time we get to the end of this, we can try to determine if we're headed toward equity or if we got a long way to go. So I have promised all of the people that I know living with HIV that I would start all my presentations talking about the virus. And the reason that I do that is from my experience in working in HIV, HIV is the only medical clinical condition that we initially left to the community to solve. For many, many, many years, People living with HIV were outside of the healthcare infrastructure, and a new parallel infrastructure was created in order to respond to their needs. That has very serious bearing on how we've been able to impact this epidemic. You heard Dr. Puckman summarize how our communities have changed and transitioned over the years. Well, if you start from a community that has scarce resources, trying to solve a medical clinical problem with lack of access to those resources is going to take a long time before you're able to impact it. We're there, and I've promised people I'm going to spend my time trying to get HIV back inside the healthcare, public health, clinical realm. So we're going to understand some numbers, we're going to look at the context for addressing need, and then we're going to see what our nation's doing about HIV. Now, five years ago, President Obama said the United States will become a place where new infections are rare, and when they occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, identity, socioeconomic circumstances, will have unfettered access to high-quality, life-extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. That was the preamble to the first-ever national strategy 
to address HIV in this country. Now, we could spend the whole time talking about what it means to have unfettered access to high quality, life extending care free from stigma and discrimination about all the concerns that we are here to talk about today. This president said, we're gonna take on HIV and we're glad he did. Now, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Well, I'm gonna show you some slides. My role this morning is to just put together the context and show you some numbers. But what's really important is to understand what this epidemic has done in various communities. So if you take a look at these slides, you'll see very clearly that there's a disproportionate burden being borne by African Americans as it relates to HIV. And any way you slice it, you'll see by the time it's over that there are some things that we need to do to impact the epidemic. So there was a point in which there was a dramatic shift in the numbers. Now this one, percentage of people, just take a color and follow it through the slides. African Americans happen to be at the top of the line, right? Let's take a look again. Well, in the early days of the epidemic, we didn't have enough data. Once we started getting everybody tested, then we understood what was going on. The percentages and the numbers start to shift. So at about 1999, 19, 2000, African Americans overtook white Americans in the greatest numbers of people, new infections. And it keeps going. And it's never turned back. So again, remember, I say pick a number. You may want to track white, you may want to track Latino, you may want to track Asian Pacific Islander, you may want to track African Americans, but the numbers keep going up. Now, it's also important to understand initially who was living with the virus. At one point we thought it was mostly white men. And with the numbers showed us initially, but we were under testing various populations. We didn't have enough information. And remember, we're talking about under-resourced communities that, again, we had left the community to identify people at risk, test people, and then provide people with that information. And then we even had clinics being built to deliver care. But if you're in an under-resourced community, you're gonna have access at a much slower, later pace. However, here we are, 2010, and the absolute numbers of African Americans and white Americans, gay men, are the same. We, you know, there's, there's constant debate about who's most impacted by HIV. And there are ongoing discussions about, well, how many women, how many men, who are they? There is no question in this country that this is largely an epidemic of men. That doesn't mean that there aren't women and transgender intersex folks that are living with HIV. It's just that the greatest single percentage are men. Now, somewhere along the way, we started taking a look at the age groups of men, and lo and behold, we find out that it doesn't play out the same across all men, even though the numbers are looking the same. If you take a closer look, we find out that indeed young African-American men between the ages of 13 and 24 indeed are looking like they are the most heavily impacted group. And more recently, their numbers are 50%, nearly 50% of the new infections. Now, let me just ask a question. How many here are over 35 in this room? Okay, I'd say about roughly 60%. These people were not born when we discovered HIV. HIV is 100% preventable. 100% preventable. A disease for which we have no cure. And the fastest growing group are people under the age of 25. They shouldn't be getting HIV. We know how to prevent it. We know how to treat it. And we've got young people now coming, showing up as the most heavily impacted. But it's not only young people. Everybody immediately jumps to, oh, let's go get the 13 to 24 year olds. Well, we got people that are 35 to 45 that are living with HIV. And among the men, they are the group that is the most prominent. So are we having conversations with that population? But any way you slice it, who shows up at the top? 
And, you know, this is not my data. This is the data from the U.S. government's Centers for Disease Control Prevention Surveillance Department. Pick a color. Which color? Which color has the greatest percentage? Which color has the greatest number? Where's the highest incidence? Looks to me like African American. So, of the nearly a couple hundred thousand folks that were diagnosed, 47% of the total were African American, 64% of the women, 66% of the women attributed to heterosexual contact, and 67% of the kids were African American. Now, we all know that African Americans are only 12% of the population. How did we claim 50% of the epidemic? How did that happen? And it doesn't matter. You take a look at rates. You can take a look at percentages. You can take a look at absolute numbers. How did that happen? Diagnosis, new infections. This is just one year, 2011. The absolute number, African Americans 11,000, white 10,000. We were the absolute highest numbers of people diagnosed with HIV three years ago. Take a look at the numbers, take a look at the colors. Imagine, who do we think that pink color is? Now, this is the slide I began with, and this is the slide in terms of the numbers that I like to end with. This slide in 1998 led the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to declare an emergency in serving the African American community in HIV. And from that time forward, the Congressional Black Caucus took a leadership position to help raise resources to be able to target prevention and treatment responses in the African American community. However, we struggle with the issue of health disparities and health inequities. And I just wanted to put this up here so that everybody is clear that, you know, when we talk about health disparities and we talk about health inequities, CDC has de defined it very clearly. There's no mystery of what we're talking about, right? We're all clear. Our government knows what we're talking about. So what are we going to do about it? Here are the places where our inequities exist in terms of HIV. That's what the culmination of the data is that I just presented to you this morning. These are the people who are most impacted, okay? African Americans and HIV, African Americans less than 12% of the population, 44% of new infections. African American women are 15 times more likely to be living with HIV than white women. 48% of new infections and three in five African Americans know somebody living with HIV or somebody who's died from HIV. This is an epidemic that is radically impacting the African American community. Where are we? There's proven prevention modalities, testing, medication, condoms, prevention programs for people who are positive, prevention programs for people who are negative, substance abuse and treatment programs, syringe exchange, and STI screening. We've got a lot of work that we've been doing in HIV prevention. At the same time, we've got a lot of work we've been doing in treatment. We've got treatment for moms to reduce transmission to their babies. We've got treatment for adults so that there's less virus and less likely to pass it on. We have pre-exposure pre prophylaxis for folks who may be at high risk but don't have the epidemic, have the virus yet. And then we have folks who have possibly exposed themselves and we can give them post-exposure prophylaxis so that antiretroviral treatment has been very successful. So we've come a long way. The challenges are now trying to take our knowledge and information and making sure that we have a highly active HIV prevention agenda. And that agenda involves testing linkage to care, prevention with positives, prevention with people who are at risk, making sure that people are in treatment for um, STDs and STIs, but we also have an issue around criminalization of HIV and we need a social justice and a human rights framework to understand what we're doing. Finally, I just want to end by saying that we're at a place now in the epidemic where we know what to do and we know how to be successful. We need testing to be routine, we need treatment being offered to everybody who is HIV positive, and we need an environment in which it's okay to be living with HIV. 35 years into the epidemic, stigmatizing people with HIV and criminalizing people with HIV has an inverse effect on people coming forward and being tested and people being screened. So I just want to leave you with the idea that we can get there 
if we decide that we want to take the medical, clinical, public health approach. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Marsha, for laying the, the laying out the landscape for which I'm going to talk about community viral load. Um, community viral load is uh, really a relatively new way that we can measure progress in HIV prevention, and also it helps us to look at health disparities and health inequities, um, as Marsha outline for us. So I am going to um, spend some time defining what is community viral load and how we are approaching the measurement of it. I'm going to highlight some of the challenges and limitations in using it and then show you some examples of how it can be used to identify health disparities and inform our HIV treatment and prevention efforts. And I'm going to use Washington DC as a case example. So what is the viral load? I understand we probably have a mixed audience here of some clinicians and um, some non-clinicians. The viral load is the way that we measure the amount of virus that's circulating in the blood of a person who's infected with HIV. Sometimes you might hear it talked about as the HIV RNA, um, and we measure it using this unit called the copies per milliliter. The viral load is a measure that's routinely monitored by clinicians and providers. Generally, we look at a, a viral load in a person every quarter. Um, and the goal is to get that person to a level where their viral load is undetectable. And depending on what test you're using, that could be a level of less than 200, a, less, a level of less than 50 copies, 40 copies, less than 20. The idea is that the lower you can get it, the better outcome you're going to have at the individual level, and also it reduces that person's risk of transmission uh, to almost zero. So it's really important for us to get that viral load down on an individual level. The community viral load is a population-based measure of the concentration of virus um, in HIV-infected individuals. So rather than looking at the individual, we're looking really on the community and a, and a kind of a public health level. Um, community viral load has been um, has been measured and represents the level of viremia in a community in a particular geographic area. And it can be used as a potential marker for HIV transmission and also as a marker of quality of HIV care and treatment. And um, some of the data that I'm going to show you in the definitions come from a document that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put together to guide the measurement and use of community viral load. So why do we care to measure it? Well, um, first by measuring it, we can again hopefully assess progress in care and treatment and therefore reductions in the community level of viral load. The hypothesis really behind this is that if you are able to get people's individual level viral load down, the community viral load will go down and hopefully you will see a lower incidence or lower number of new cases in a population. So there have been quite a few studies that have supported the use of community viral load. Um, the first is here um, on, I guess, your left, uh, which is a study that was conducted by Tom Quinn et al. in um, in Uganda that showed that if you can get the viral load level down to less than 1,500 copies per milliliter, that the risk of transmission is essentially nil. So that was very um, sound scientific evidence at an individual level that the viral load was an important predictor of transmission. The second is a study that came out in 2011. Um, this is called the HPTN052 study that looked at treating serodiscordant partners, so partners where one person was HIV infected and one person was HIV negative. In this study, they treated all of the um, all of the people who were treated immediately who were HIV infected reduced their risk of transmitting virus to 96%. This study was really a landmark study in the field of HIV research and care and treatment. We'd never had any kind of prevention activity or prevention intervention that has reduced the risk of transmission at that high a level. 
So 96% reduction in transmission. And this, these findings were quickly adapted into the US Department of Health and Human Services treatment guidelines, and also into the World Health Organization treatment guidelines as well. And then finally at the bottom of the slide is a study um, that was conducted as a mathematical modeling study. So it was hypothetical in its premise, but the idea was that if you could take a population, test everyone in that population for HIV, anyone who was HIV positive would immediately be linked to care and start antiretroviral therapy, that you could reduce uh, infectiousness by 99%. So again, this was a theoretical um, model, uh, but there have been several studies now that are trying to see if in reality this model will work. But all of these, um, all of these studies really reinforce the concept that if you can reduce that HIV viral load, that you can also have benefits in preventing and reducing transmission. So when we talk about measuring viral load, there are really two things that we're looking at. One is the total community viral load. So that's where you take all of the viral loads that you have in a particular community or population and you basically sum them up. And the idea again is that that will give you a measure of the population's potential infectiousness. So how much circulating virus is there in the community? The other measure which we see more commonly used is the mean or median community viral load. So again, you're adding up all all of the viral loads that you have for a particular community, and then you divide it by the total number of people in that community. And that's supposed to give you a sense of the average viral burden in the population. And again, I'm going to show you some examples um, of these measures specifically. First, I want to, just given what I've told you about viral load there are, and measuring community viral load, there are a couple of things that you have to consider. So the first is, how do you define your community? Okay, CDC has guidance now out there, but basically there are three or four different measures. There's the monitored viral load, the population viral load, and the in-care viral load. And I'll show you on the next slide how they've defined those different communities. The other uh, issue to consider is which viral load measure do you use? So again, I mentioned that normally we check the uh, viral load on a person about every quarter. And so you're going to have very um, variable numbers of viral loads. So do you look at a person's most recent viral load? Do you add up all of the viral load measures that they've ever had? And a lot of times it just depends on the period of time that you're looking at. Um, the third issue is how do you deal with missing data? And this is really important in how we interpret viral load. So if you have people who you have no viral load measure on them, does that mean that they're out of care? And does that mean that you should assume that they have uncontrolled virus and that they are at really high risk of transmitting virus? Or are those people who've had controlled virus and just aren't being seen by their healthcare provider as frequently as some other people? So again, when we're measuring community viral, viral load, we have to take that into consideration. Do we just ignore that missing data or do we somehow try to include it? And lastly, it's important to also understand a huge assumption that we're making when we're looking at community viral load. And that is that we are assuming that, um, that the information that we're getting is reflective of sexual behaviors or other HIV transmission risks um, among that particular population or community. So here's this conceptual framework that I mentioned that the CDC has developed. Um, again, the point here just to show you the, um, the different measures of, oops, sorry. Let's see. Okay, so sorry for one half of the room, you can't see the pointer. But the idea here is that we have four different populations or communities that we're measuring the viral load in. The monitored viral load and the in-care viral load. So that's really people who are coming into clinical care fairly regularly. And then the community viral load and the population viral load. Those are really our public health measures of virus circulating in a population. And I just also want to point out so this graph over here shows you the transmission potential and the quality of care. So the idea is that the higher the population viral load, the higher the risk of transmission, and that the um, monitored viral load is really a measure of the quality of care. Again, those are the people who are getting HIV care fairly regularly and you have um, 
viral load values to use to measure it. Okay. So I'm going to take just a few minutes to show you a couple of examples. So um, this is an example of four different populations. They all have the same HIV prevalence. So they all have the same number of people, uh, same proportion of people who are living with HIV in these communities. These are communities of 10 people. Um, and if you look at the bottom of each of these populations, the mean community viral load is 10,000 for each of these populations. But if you look at population A, the mean community viral load is 10,000, but we see a range of measures from 2,000 to 17,000 viral, uh, viral load copies. So again here, there's a pretty even distribution in this population. If you look at population B, same community viral load, it's 10,000. But there's only one person, that one person in red, who's really driving that community viral load up. That person has a viral load measure of 100,000 copies, okay? But everybody else is undetectable. And then if you look at population C, same thing. We have that one person who has a very high viral load. That person is driving the mean community viral load. But that person, if you see that that person is linked to a person who's also infected and has an undetectable viral load. And that person, we assume, is in a monogamous relationship. So is there really a high risk of transmission among that particular population? Well, if we look at population D, again, we have the same 10 people. We have that one person with a very high viral load, 100,000 copies, but that person has five sexual partners. And so the risk of transmitting virus in that particular population is much higher than it was in, say, population B or population C. So using those data, I just wanted to, that was hypothetical, but there have been a lot of cities that have very high HIV prevalence that have been measuring community viral load. The first area to really do this was uh, Vancouver and British Columbia in Canada. Um, uh, Julio Montanay and Evan Woods were really kind of the leaders in this measuring community viral load. And they found that there was a direct relationship between viral load concentration and HIV incidence among injection drug users, and also that when they expanded their antiretroviral therapy cover coverage, that they saw a dramatic decline in the community viral load over time, and also a dramatic decline in the number of uh, new HIV diagnoses. After those um, really sentinel studies that were conducted in Canada, um, my colleague Mopoli Das in San Francisco also sought to measure the community viral load, and they found that the mean viral load was about 23,000 copies. And then another colleague um, in New York City has also done some measurement there, and looking at their community viral load was about 20,000 copies. And I just want you to all to have that information so that when we talk about DC, you have some comparison uh, to look at. So in DC in 2008-2009, we sought to apply these measures of community viral load to figure out what was happening here in DC and to see if we had any health disparities. So just to give you all a sense of what the epidemic looks like here in Washington, there are about 16,000 people living with HIV in the city. This is as of the end of 2012. We had over 4,000 new cases diagnosed uh, between 2008 and 2012, and that gives us the overall prevalence of about 2.5%. So if you look at that map, uh, essentially, any area that's red has a prevalence that is greater than 1%, which means generally everybody living in DC is at risk for HIV infection. And when we did studies to test people and then figure out if they already knew if they were infected, about one half to one third of people were unaware of their HIV status. So we used public health surveillance data. We looked at the addresses of where people were living who had HIV. And we also looked at how complete was our data on viral load uh, measurements. Again, if you don't have a viral load measure, for us that's an indication of not being in regular care. We measured the mean and the total viral load. And then we also did mapping, which was very, very um, interesting in terms of looking at the disparities that we see in DC with respect to viral load and some other uh, socioeconomic indicators. 
So a quick summary of um, what we found. Uh, about half of people were missing viral loads, and the boxes in blue show you where um, we saw a disproportionate number of people who uh, were missing viral loads. So men, blacks, and Hispanics were more likely not to have viral load data. Again, to us, that indicates that these are probably people who are not receiving regular HIV care. When we measured our mean community viral load, it ended up being about 33,000 copies. Now remember in New York and San Francisco, their viral load measures were about uh, 20,000 copies. So again, seeing much higher risk of, of circulating virus here in DC. And our total viral load, that aggregate sum, was 158 million copies. That's a lot of virus in the city. We also looked at the proportion of people who had a detectable viral load. So people who are not meeting um, that cutoff for reducing their risk of transmission. And again, the boxes in dark blue indicate where we saw those disparities. So women had higher mean community viral load, men had higher total viral load, blacks across the board were doing um, worse than uh, persons of other races and ethnicities. Uh, we saw disparities in age groups, so 20 to 29 year olds having higher viral loads. And then if you look also at uh, risk of transmission and mode of transmission, heterosexuals, injection drug users, and then of course the people who were either publicly insured or underinsured also had disproportionately high viral loads. And then we also sought to look at whether or not the trends that we were seeing here in DC were similar to those that had been documented in Canada. So if we were seeing a decline in the number of new diagnoses and a decline in the community viral load, was there an association there? Unfortunately, when we looked at our data, we did not see any association between our declining viral load and the number of new diagnoses. Um, we actually are looking at updating these data now since it's um, been quite a few years. And so it'll be interesting to see if, given a lot of the new initiatives and prevention efforts that are going on in the city, whether or not we still see that association. And then finally, here's this mapping that we did, looking at the distribution of mean and total community viral load, um, and looking at socioeconomic indicators. So in the top left corner, we have the mean community viral load, again, which was around 30,000. The darker the blue, the higher the viral load. And then we also looked at the total community viral load. And then in the bottom panels, we looked at the poverty rate. So again, if you look at the mean community viral load and the poverty rate, visually it appears that the higher the viral load, higher viral loads correspond to areas with worse socioeconomic status indicators, poverty, and the percentage of people um, with a high school diploma. So those are some examples of how community viral load's been used. Um, we've taken this data here in DC and used it to monitor prevention activities, to look at access to care and treatment programs. There's a lot of work now focusing on hot spots and trying to figure out where there's a lot of transmission, identifying those populations that are at high, highest risk for HIV, and targeting our um, prevention activities there. But nationally, uh, we're also seeing that community viral load has been included as an outcome indicator in the National HIV AIDS Strategy, and it's also being used to measure the impact of some large community-based HIV testing studies. So we just had one study completed here in DC looking at that concept of test and treat, and also, um, and that study was called the Testing and Linkage to Care Plus Study. So in summary, um, the use of community viral load as a proxy for the viral burden in a community has really increased over time. I think when we did this, we were probably the fifth city to actually try to measure community viral load. I looked quickly last night online at some publications. There were at least 22 additional publications that have um, done this, and I know those um, the cities and the, and the countries that are doing this range from countries in Africa to, I know Providence, Rhode Island, for example, is, 
is measuring community viral load. But it really does seem to be a useful marker for us to look at trends over time, to look at the effects of programs that are being developed, and of course to identify disparities in HIV care, treatment, and access. I think the geospatial analyses are very useful for informing where we can target our interventions. And um, just to echo what Dr. Martin was saying, I think based on what we're seeing with community viral load findings, we really do need to focus our efforts on universal HIV testing, making sure that we have access to universal care and treatment, um, and then once you get people into care, making sure that they are retained and engaged fully in care, and then continuing to use community viral load to again monitor the impact of these programs. So with that, I'm going to stop. I wanted to acknowledge my colleagues at the DC Department of Health and at GW and other collaborators who've also been working on community viral load over the last several years. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Nina DiLorenzo, and I'm with AbbVie, and uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about hepatitis C, um, so we get the whole, um, the whole picture from HIV and HCV. Uh, and I'm going to give you a lot of statistics, so I apologize, but they're actually pretty stunning when you think about them. So um, it's loaded with a lot of statistics, but forgive me, um, it'll, but it'll, I think it'll give you the right picture of what's going on in hepatitis C in the country. Hepatitis C infections are reaching epidemic levels. Um, in fact, Hep C has replaced HIV AIDS as the most deadly viral disease in the United States and is five times more infectious. Uh, it is also the leading cause of catastrophic liver damage, cirrhosis, liver transplants, and liver cancer, which is the fastest growing cause of cancer-related deaths. Hep C disproportionately affects baby boomers, a group that is five times more likely to be infected, as well as veterans and minority Americans, particularly African Americans and Latinos. In fact, African Americans and Latinos are about twice as likely to be infected with Hep C as other Americans. Prevalence of the virus is 3% among African Americans and 2.6% among Latinos, compared to 1.5% of the general population. To put it another way, African Americans comprise about 13% of the U.S. population, yet they are nearly 23% of the patients living with Hep C. Within the African American community, chronic liver disease disease, which is often hep C related, is a leading cause of death among people between the ages of 45 and 64. Latinos also have a significantly higher hep C mortality rate than the general population. CDC data for the year 2011 shows the hep C mortality rate per 100,000 people was four for Caucasians, but 7.15 for Latinos. That's nearly two times higher. In addition, a National Institutes of Health study determined Latinos with viral hepatitis have faster liver fibrosis progression rates, are infected at an earlier age, and are more likely to be HIV co-infected. These factors make the Latino community especially vulnerable to liver disease, cancer, and other deadly conditions resulting from hep C. Without effective intervention, it is estimated that deaths due to hep, to hep C virus will double or even triple in the next 20 years. The two biggest drivers fueling the impact of Hep C are a lack of disease awareness due to insufficient screening, as well as restrictions on treatment. And I think that sort of echoes what happens in, in, on HIV as well. Screening for Hep C is not nearly as commonplace as it needs to be. The CDC estimates that up to 75% of Americans who have Hep C are unaware of their infection. While some states have started to implement regulations to promote screening for baby boomers along the guidelines that the CDC has issued, um, Hep C testing really should be routine for anyone who's at risk. Another hurdle to combating Hep C lies with access to treatment. Uh, while breakthrough medicines are offering unprecedented hope for patients these days, many private health plans as well as Medicaid programs are restricting access to these new innovative treatments and cures that are now available. 
The kinds of restrictions that are being implemented include mandating that patients first fail older treatments that are less effective and have debilitating side effects before they can have the new, more effective medicines. Um, restrictions also include restricting access to only the sickest patients, which means patients reach end-stage liver disease uh, with, with often ir irreversible liver damage. Um, and other restrictions include denying access to a cure for anyone who's struggling with substance abuse. Hep C is a deadly disease for which effective treatment is available, yet it is being widely restricted. Imagine if there was a mandate that cancer patients had to reach metastatic levels before receiving chemo, or that a diabetic person had to lose a limb before receiving insulin therapy. Hep C treatment restrictions are not only devastating for patients facing life-threatening liver disease, but also represent a lost opportunity to mitigate a public health threat that disproportionately affects minority communities. Such restrictions also prioritize short-term bu budget savings or the opportunity to minimize long-term healthcare expenditures by creating better patient outcomes. In fact, there's a growing body of evidence um, that is proving the cost effectiveness of uh, curing hepatitis C. Patients living with Hep C average more than five times the number of hospitalizations and more than three times the number of emergency room visits as patients without the virus. Hep C is also the leading indication for liver transplants. This procedure costs approximately $577,000 in the first year alone and then requires continual medications at about $4,000 a month. A new study in the Annals of Internal Medicine suggests that the new innovative treatments that are out now for Hep C are available, um, are cost effective in 83% of new patients and 81% of previously treated patients. Uh, another study just published suggests that immediately treating Hep C patients with new treatments is cost effective even for those with only moderate disease progression. So raising awareness about the need for hepatitis screening, uh, hepatitis C screening and treatment is a clear public policy imperative that will require educating policymakers at every level, state, local, federal. Um, this means advocating for policy action that increases testing and, and reverses discriminatory short-sighted treatment restrictions that are hurting Hep C patients, especially minority Americans. As healthcare leaders and advocates, we need to insist on better public policy for hepatitis C. It's a devastating, devastating disease. So what specifically can we do? Um, the, the Department of Health and Human Services National Viral Hepatitis Ac Action Plan actually sets out a meaningful roadmap for ta tackling hep C um, disparities and inequities. It also calls for an effective multi-stakeholder approach to address the epidemic. Uh, the Viral Hepatitis Testing Act, which is currently pending in the House of Representatives, would direct HHS to create a national system that promotes hepatitis B and C testing and treatment, particularly within minority communities. This Viral Hepatitis Testing Act also makes hepatitis C a public health priority. It seeks to increase the number of individuals who are aware of their hepatitis C infections and would also help ensure that patients who test positive then get connected to the care and counseling that they need. Congress should swiftly enact this, this act, the Vir Viral Hepatitis Testing Act. Uh, additionally, President Obama's budget doubles the amount of money for the CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis so that the CDC can continue its efforts and increase its efforts uh, to raise public awareness about hepatitis C testing and treatment. And that it can, so the CDC can also continue its grants to address Hep C among the country's most vulnerable populations. It also requests supplemental funding for the Veterans Administration, which is really important um, because there's an extremely high prevalence of hepatitis C among veterans, and many of whom are also minorities. In the states, many Medicaid programs are considering restricting access to new medicines that cure hepatitis C. Um, if they haven't already implemented those restrictions. Um, those are really short-sighted public health policy because curing hepatitis C can save lives and drive down healthcare costs in the long term, and that doesn't even scratch the surface of the human effect of those kinds of restrictions. Um, in addition, um, you know, I, I think Medicaid programs need to be made aware that restricting access to hep C treatment 
discriminates against minority populations who are disproportionately affected by this devastating disease. Um, combating the devastating effects of hepatitis C is definitely within our reach. Um, we can and must close the gap um, on these racial and ethnic, ethnic disparities and the inequities um, in the disease and its treatment. But it will take a concerted effort um, at the local, state, and federal level to increase access to screening and to connect patients to a cure. So thank you for your time this morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And once we start, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. This is a great um, introduction for our program. We're running a bit short on time, but I do want to open up the floor to questions. There is one, however, general question that I want to, to ask of our panelists, especially because we do have a mixture of clinicians and non-clinicians in here. The common theme, obviously, running through uh, this morning's discussion is awareness um, and testing, which we know is a huge problem, especially with the stigma of both diseases, but particularly HIV-AIDS. Um, so I would like for our panelists to talk a little bit briefly about what they have had, had to do in order to promote um, testing when they're dealing with the stigma of, of these chronic diseases, and in particular HIV AIDS. The number one. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, HIV testing should be a routine part of medical care. And if it is routine, that is the number one thing that will impact awareness on both the public health, clinical health side, as well as the community side. If on an annual basis everybody is tested for HIV, in some states they have mandated it by law that it has to be mandatory offer by the physician. In other places it's really an opt out. The assumption is that you will be tested for HIV if you enter into certain emergency departments. But that is the number one step that would change the course of HIV. HIV in this country, as if everybody was tested and everybody was offered an HIV test, and that the record of that test were listed in everybody's medical record. I would agree, and Marcia's being very humble. She started the routine testing campaign here in Washington, D.C., which was the first city in the United States to try to get everyone tested for HIV back in 2006 when CDC changed their routine testing guidelines and we were able to identify hundreds of people who were HIV infected through that routine testing and it made a huge impact. I think now the, the harder part is getting providers actually to buy in. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of work to do still as a provider myself to get other providers to understand the importance of doing non-risk-based testing um, and making sure that those offers happen routinely. Nina, I want you to answer that question, but you have an additional question, and that is, for you, it's not even just a matter of testing. There's a lot of people who don't understand about hepatitis C being a chronic illness. When you talked about its rates of transmission being higher, partially because it's so much easier to, to transmit. So can you address that as well? Yeah, so that's, that's actually what I was going to say. So what's, what's really interesting, and I'm a non-clinician, so don't ask him any hard medical questions. But, you know, when I started working in this area was, you know, I didn't know what hepatitis C was either. There's, so, you know, nobody knows what it is, and it's deadly. And so um, it's stunning to me that there isn't routine testing for it. And what we've tried to do as a company is to promote you know, better policy around screening, which the CDC has great guidelines, right? But then, you know, making sure that that gets adopted by by Medicare and then going to the states and saying, hey, you really should be screened. And this is just for baby boomers, right? We're just asking for, you know, baby boomers, but it's kind of crazy. And, and it's a real uphill battle because, you know, understandably medical professionals don't want to be told what to do. They don't want another mandate from the state, but it's, it's really, um, it's amazing, and so so you know all these people, millions of people walking around not knowing it, and and it's as you know populations are are, are growing older and living longer, and so this is going to be a huge, huge issue. And I, I would just like to add that uh, for HIV, for every transmission, it's estimated that that's a cost of about four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars in medical care costs that happen to keep somebody healthy. Well, at least now for hepatitis C, we have a cure. And for every patient that has it, if we get them in screened and get them in the care, we cure that individual. And it's, you know, 20% the cost 
of what I've just described in HIV. There are 50,000 new infections of HIV every year at the tune of $400,000, $500,000. It's an $18 billion just of the new cohort each year. That is a huge healthcare cost. We're now struggling to try to encourage people to screen for HCV, and there's a cure. And the access to the life-saving treatments are available, and everybody knows how to get patient assistance programs and get access. States are looking at covering it. But we have you know, a problem with getting the clinicians to screen for it. And I want to open up the floor to questions. Do you want to come up to the microphone? Good morning, and thank you for your presentation. I'm Reverend Dr. Veronica Clark Tasker, professor of nursing at Howard University. And one of the things that I find very troubling is the fact that who mandated that we cannot get treatment for hep C? Because you said that it was supportable that they had to first have these very high levels. And I find that troubling because as a practitioner, like on the floor, say 20, all 20, no matter what their diagnosis is, they have hep C. So it's just like when you made the comparison to cancer. Oh, I have to have metastatic disease before I can get treating. I find that appallable. And so that what can we do when we look at elections and everything coming up, how can we find out who voted for that craziness and how can we can get rid of the problem? So, so unfortunately, it's not a voting thing, right? So it's, it's certain health plans um, and certain Medicaid programs that are just choosing not to cover. Um, and we can certainly get you more information, you know, state by state, but we, we have to have people going and demanding um, that there be access for patients who, who need these medicines. And again, like you said, there are patient assistance programs, right? So all the companies have them. AbbVie has one. Gilead, who has another treatment, they have them too. So there are ways to access those that way. But I think there's a general policy issue when you're choosing short-term budget, you know, you, to, to, to go for short-term budget savings as opposed to looking at your population and saying, gosh, we should really cure all these people of hepatitis C now that there's access to a cure. It used to be in HIV that we waited till everybody was sick before we gave them treatments as well. Now that we've finally moved to test and treat, but it's also because we have access to medications and they're off patent and we're now at a point where um, the globe has resources for HIV and it's now the policy to test people and to put them into treatment, not wait till their immune system is shot. You know, the olden days until we got the cure for hepatitis C, we were dissuading people from getting treatment because the treatments were so, so, so challenging. And, you know, the concern was everybody was going to need a liver and everything else. So I think it's really, I mean, back to the policy issue, but if the clinicians come forward and say, we are ready to test and treat hepatitis C, we'll get there but we need the clinicians to be in that conversation. It's the clinicians that are driving test and treat in HIV. Thank you. So we have our final three questions. I'm gonna go over here and then I'll alternate. So uh, thank you so much for this panel. My name is Donna Cryer. I lead the Global Liver Institute. Um, first, I wanted to be able to offer anyone in the, in the audience uh, interested in fighting these restrictions and knowing more about what we can do as an advocacy community uh, to support liver patients, access to the cure, to either reach out to me or I know Christine Rodriguez from the National uh, Hep Viral Hepatitis Roundtable is also present today um, and is a very powerful voice. So we offer ourselves, but to the panelists, I just wanted to ask, um, we are such, we owe such a debt to the uh, HIV advocates and the models and, and battles that they've fought in testing. And I just wonder what we can do um, as, as liver advocates to learn from you and to join with you so that there are more joint HIV and HCV screenings so that there, we're really leveraging all of the resources that we have in the community. I can comment from a uh, research standpoint. Um, we are doing a lot, still a lot of HIV testing in DC and I'm collaborating with one of my colleagues at GW who um, I decided to go out and test, you know, you, I showed you all maps. 
of where there's a lot of HIV in DC. And so we decided to go to those kind of hotspot areas and do testing. And she said, let's couple it with hep C testing and see what we find. And so she tested um, a small number, a smaller number of people than I did for hep C. And she found that 20 to 35% of people were, were hep C positive. And this was, again, only going to areas where we knew there was a lot of HIV infection. And so that's just one example of where you know we can piggyback our efforts and do what we're doing with HIV, use the same strategies for hep C. And with that, she was able to identify you know about 60% of people who are unaware of their infections and link those people into care and treatment for hep C. So that's just an example from a research standpoint. I know the health department is also incorporating hep C testing at its um, free STD clinic. And so they've also been able to identify hundreds of people who are unaware of their infections as well. But, but I also think, um, and thank you for your work on, on Global Liver um, Work and Foundation, uh, but I also think there's a challenge to marry the two because the HIV movement, the advocacy, came out of a period of what I call gay AIDS. And there was an, an identity, uh, human rights, uh, social justice movement that was parallel. Um, what I hear from my colleagues working in hepatitis who have been in HIV and are trying to make the bridge is that that personal identity that is attached to hepatitis C doesn't have the collaborative constituency that people have embraced and are fighting for rights. And so uh, what they're telling me is that it's much more difficult to get a group of people with hep C together to do advocacy because it is associated with a whole other host of socio-cultural dynamics that folks don't want to talk about. So there's, you know, putting it on the individual to me is part of the challenge and I would put it back on the clinicians. This is again one of these viruses that I would rather have a doctor help me understand I have than for me to have an advocacy community that tells me about it, that I then join, that I then go to work with, that will finally get people tested. We cannot wait that long when we have a virus for which we have a cure. We need clinicians to screen people for hepatitis C, just like we need them to screen them for HIV. We don't have a cure in HIV yet, but if you get treated for HIV, you heard the doctor say you're at 96, 98% less infectious, unlikely to transmit. We can give you pre-exposure prophylaxis if you're at high risk for HIV. The treatments are working on the virus side and it's working to prevent acquisition. We know that now, but if you don't screen and we don't know and we can't get you in the treatment, we can't do a thing about that circulating virus in the community. The same is true of hepatitis C. We cannot wait 30 years for the community of people that are living with hepatitis C to organize themselves to demand better treatment. No. So I want to, we have, we're running out of time, but I want to take these last two uh, questions, so we're going to do this briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, I uh, very much appreciate your presentations together, but the first one, and you start from the clinical perspective, and I thought, you know, the, about the HIV first, and then going to the hep, hep C. Um, for, for us clinicians, we are the recipients of the messages. So I think it's about time, I very much appreciate about, you know, how can we move from, for the, from the HIV perspective, you know, to a medical model. Because we, we as clinicians, we are receptive, we are the, you know, we are the recipients of messages that has been coming through. So I think it's about time to destigmatize HIV. Uh, I have, a, we have patients that came who had AIDS at the time, that uh, is being cured but still very much receive the treatment kind of preventive. So, you know, the, 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 the feedback we got, we got is that uh, they come back very angry, say we don't have AIDS, but we don't have the disease. But uh, so what do you call this group? You know, so I see here flipping around, you know, on presentations about HIV, uh, what truly is it mean from a medical perspective? The message is not clear for us to destigmatize at the time. So, you know, how can we do the prevention as, as well, you know, with that? So the, 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 the challenge, you know, for the community is how to help us clinicians to have that message uh, about, you know, that. Because 
We have been seeing patients being angry with us, but they are receiving the, the medication to treat the disease as a disease. Thank you. Do one of you want to respond to that? You raise a very important point, and we are a long way from changing the messages in HIV. We struggle with them right now. In fact, um, prevention is being described as we're medicalizing it, and we're going to be giving people pills, and what does that mean for the community? Um, again, I would just encourage that we can work through the messages. This is, you saw my presentation, I started with the picture of the virus. It's a virus. Before it is anything else, it is a virus. And if the clinician can own that part and treat it as such, we'll try to do a better job on the community sociocultural side to help those living with the virus work through all of the issues that need to be disentangled and what I would describe as discarded. Thank you, Dr. Martin. And now for our final question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I thank both all of you for your presentations, and I'm struck by one thing. And I think that you talked about the power of geospatial analysis and the power of geography as an epidemiologic variable. And I also think you illustrated very clearly that there is a correlation or HIV hepatitis C in the geography, and you identified what we call hot spots. I would hypothesize that in those same hot spots, if you will, we have untreated hypertension, we have untreated diabetes, we have untreated all of the issues that exist. And in a sense, geography becomes our epidemiologic tool for listening to communities in the aggregate at the neighborhood level. Now, I would ask you one question, particularly around the HIV, and I support testing, I support getting people into treatment, but what is the role of primary prevention for HIV in these same hot spots? Because I would hypothesize that not only do we have HIV in these hot spots, but there are other sexually transmitted diseases that are prevalent, and we can prevent those primary through primary prevention. So what's the role of primary prevention in these hot spots, and how do we focus our resources to really see the benefit of primary prevention. Thank you, Dr. Castell. So one of my dreams, <laughs> I used to work in Africa and HIV. That's kind of where I came from and, and, and came back to DC, which is my hometown. And, but in Africa, in a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, we do, they do door-to-door -door testing, they do population-based surveys, where they're going and they're not only asking about HIV, but they're testing for anemia and malaria, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like this is a model that needs to be somehow incorporated into the United States in these areas where we are seeing high burdens of HIV, STDs, hepatitis C, but also diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. And so my dream would be to be able to do that type of community-based outreach where you go out, and, it, and I think it also helps destigmatize the focus exactly. on HIV and Hep C and, and STDs by asking about general health. Just right. get a, a sense of general health in these communities, yes. you know, the full range, and including these infectious and transmissible diseases and seeing what the burden looks like in those areas. For HIV specifically, the idea behind doing the hotspot testing is to identify people, not only who are infected, obviously you want to get them into care and treatment, but the people who are not, but who have high risk behaviors, exactly. that's where it's important for us to be able to offer them prevention modalities such as pre-exposure prophylaxis. Or if we think somebody maybe is um, seroconverting and we just missed their infection by doing antibody testing, that we can get them to a clinic or some place where they can get acute testing for HIV and make sure that you know we can try to interrupt the disease progression as early as possible. So I think there's a lot of benefit in going out to these hotspot areas and trying to do this type of work more broadly. Yes, but also in those hotspots, people are more likely to have a receptivity for primary prevention as well because they know people. But I'd also like to say that 
that I do think as epidemiologists, it's important that we begin to use geography as a variable and bring it up to the level of our other descriptive variables and maybe even bury the descriptive variables inside of the geography because I think that leads a way to create hope around ending disparities and moving toward a more equitable health platform rather than simply pointing out the neighborhoods and communities that are suffering. Therefore, we can then create a platform for moving forward. And that's a comment more than a, a, a question. So thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I just, to the last two comments, um, you know, what we have in H, actually the last three, what we have been able to do in HIV is mobilize a community constituency that has decided to build some resources. And globally, there is an infusion of dollars to expand those models. We have the same thing in the United States. What I would encourage an HIV and Hep C community to do is, in fact, to come together to see how we can leverage the HIV assets to go beyond HIV. And folks are trying to understand that from the HIV point of view, but all of you can help by bringing expertise and understanding because HIV is in a silo. It can be expanded to go horizontal instead of just be vertical. And I would use PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Release, and the global approach as a model. What we understand from Ebola is that in the countries where they had built up infrastructure from the AIDS response and matured that infrastructure had a different trajectory with Ebola. They had assets and resources that could be used and were able to do some intervention. We can do that with HIV. HIV clinics and programs and case managers and outreach workers and testers are in communities and neighborhoods that people didn't want to go to. People didn't want to serve these folks. People didn't want to be around them. We have syringe exchange programs all over the country in neighborhoods serving communities that nobody wants to talk about. Those folks have assets and access to the exact same communities that we're talking about now, but they need bridge clinical knowledge and information and that will come from you all. So I would just suggest to pick back up on the last three comments, there are some things that we can do to leverage, but you have to come inside and say, I have something I think I can offer to expand capacity and to expand your reach. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin. So I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Marsha Martin, Dr. Amanda Castell, and Ms. Nina DeLorenzo. Can we give them a round of applause? And this is just the beginning of our, our day, so I'm sure you'll be around to answer some more questions. And so now we're gonna be moving on with our next panel. So thank you.